Hey folks, today we're going to talk about the Christoffel Darbo kernel and root interlacing. Let's start out with a definition. Given a sequence of orthogonal polynomials p0, p1, etc. for a weight function r, the Christoffel Darbo kernel of degree n is defined to be the sum from k equals 0 to n of pkx times pky divided by the product, uh, inner product of pk with itself with respect to the weight function r, which these guys are orthogonal polynomials for. This definition might look a little weird at first, but let's see what it does. Let's think back to one of our original motivations for studying orthogonal polynomials, and that is calculating polynomial approximations of various functions. Let's recall for a second the degree n polynomial approximation of a function with respect to r. That is to say, this is a polynomial of degree n which is as close as possible to my function, say f of x, in terms of the norm defined by the weight function r of x. And we had an explicit formula for this. It said that the polynomial we're looking for, p of x, is the sum from k equals 0 to n of alpha k p k, where alpha k is specifically given by the inner product of the kth polynomial with f divided by the inner product of the kth polynomial with itself. Note that the term in the bottom is just the norm squared of the kth polynomial. Now think about for a second calculating the integral over the support of the weight, we'll say from b to c, of the Christoffel Darbo kernel of degree n, which is a function of x and y, times f of y dy. And if we work this out explicitly, Oh, actually, before that, I need to add the weight function, r of y dy. That looks better. Now, if I calculate this integral explicitly, I can pull out the sum, as well as any of the coefficients in the expression for the christoffel darbo kernel, which are independent of the y variable. And it ends up looking like this. And now I know when I integrate from b to c, pk of y, f of y, r of y dy, that's just the inner product of pk with r. So this is the sum from k equals 0 to n of pk of x divided by the norm of pk with itself, uh, the norm of pk squared, multiplied by the inner product of pk with f. And that is exactly our equation for p of x, that polynomial which is our close approximation. So the Christoffel Darbo kernel gives us a way to redefine getting that approximating per, uh, polynomial as some sort of transform called an integral transform. That actually brings us to a much broader definition. A function of functions, that is something which takes in a function and spits out a new function, defined specifically in this way by taking a function of x, changing it into a function of y, and then integrating it with respect to a function of x and y over y, so that I just get a function of x back out again, is called an integral transform. Uh, the thing that I'm integrating with this, uh, inside here itself, the k of x, y, is called the kernel of the transform. And you've likely already seen several examples of this in your mathematical career. Um, some common examples would include the Fourier and Laplace transforms. These are exactly examples of integral transforms. And those specifically correspond to complex exponential kernels or just exponential kernels. So anyway, we can see that the Christoffel Darbo kernel is kind of playing an interesting role here. If I want to get a polynomial which is closely approximating some function degree n, uh, I'm going to use my nth degree Christoffel Darbo kernel, perform the corresponding integral, and there's my answer. That result is going to be some sort of polynomial, which would be exactly the polynomial I was trying to calculate. Of course, in order to perform that integral in the first place, it would be really very handy to be able to have some sort of expression for the Christoffel Darbo kernel itself that's going to make it look at least a little bit more approachable when we try to integrate things. And that we can do. A nice formula for the Christoffel Darbo kernel is, believe it or not, the Christoffel, given by the Christoffel Darbo formula. And what it does is it allows me to express that sum of polynomials as a nice rational function involving just a couple polynomials itself. Specifically, it says that the Christoffel Darbo kernel of degree n is fn 
excuse me, Pn times Pn plus 1 minus Pn plus 1 times Pn and y and x respectively divided by x minus y all times some constant, uh, oops, which is going to be ln divided by the inner product of Pn with itself uh, times ln plus 1, where here what Lj is is it's the leading coefficient of the jth polynomial for all j. Now, as you might see, this formula is only going to work when x is not equal to y. And in the special case, when x is equal to y, we can really obtain that just by taking the limit as x approaches y. And we're going to see here that by definition, we're getting something related to the derivatives of these functions. Specifically, we have the same multiplying coefficient, but it's multiplying the derivative of the n plus 1 polynomial times the nth polynomial minus the n plus 1 polynomial times the derivative of the nth polynomial when y is equal to x. This result itself follows as a natural result of the three-term recursion relation we proved last time. To start out, just take our expression for the christoffel darbo kernel and multiply it by x. Now using the three-term recursion relation, I know that x times pk is equal to ak plus 1, uh, just ak times pk plus 1, plus bk times pk, plus ck times pk minus 1, where some constants a, b, and c sub k. So this means I can rewrite the sum that I'm interested in as three different sums involving the coefficients a, k, b, k, and c, k, respectively. Likewise, I could get a similar expression multiplying by y. So that y times the christoffel darbo kernel, k sub n, is equal to a sum involving a, k, b, k, and c, k, but with the worlds of x and y reversed. So now if I subtract these two expressions and gather like terms, I'm going to find that, oops, there's a bit of a typo here, it should be a y. I'm going to find that the difference is x minus y times k sub n of xy, and it's equal to the sum from k equals 0 to n minus 1 of this coefficient a k over p k inner product with itself minus c k plus 1 over inner product of p k plus 1 with itself times p k plus 1 of x times p k of y uh, and then minus a similar sum but again with x's and y's reversed and the sign reversed because of the way that the signs are taking the difference there and some remainder terms for the highest degree terms here because the sum here only goes up to n minus 1 in both cases. Now one of the things that we can show is that a k is equal to the inner product of p k with itself divided by the inner product of p k plus 1 with itself times c k plus 1 and this is comes directly from it considering the expression for uh, the inner product of pk with x squared times pk, or excuse me, pk times x times pk minus 1, which is equal to x times pk inner product with pk minus 1. So because of this equality, we actually end up with this relationship. And what that means here is that all of these terms in parentheses are actually zero. So what we get out in the end is that x minus y time the quantity times kn is equal to an divided by the norm of pn squared times the quantity pn plus 1 of x times pn of y minus pn of x times pn plus 1 of y. And if we think about it for a second, an is really just the ratio of the leading coefficient of the nth Taylor, or, or polynomial divided by the leading coefficient of the n plus 1 polynomial. So with that in mind, this proves our theorem. Notice that this actually excludes the case when x is equal to y, 
but I'll leave you to check out that formula yourself. Remembering the definition of a derivative, you should be able to get that. One of the great applications of this Christoffel Darbo formula has to do with the roots of orthogonal polynomials. Let's think about as an example the Chebyshev polynomials, which are defined by the property that Tn of cosine of theta is cosine of n theta. We can use this to determine the roots of the nth Chebyshev polynomial because we know the roots of cosine of n theta. Those are going to be precisely when n theta is equal to an odd integer multiple of pi over 2. So this means that the roots of our nth Chebyshev polynomial are going to be cosines of these values. And while it looks like there's going to be infinitely many of them, remember that cosine is periodic. And that makes a lot of sense here. I should only get finitely many because a degree, a polynomial degree n should have at most n distinct roots. So using that periodicity, we get that the roots are exactly cosine of 2k plus 1 times pi over 2n, where k varies between 0 and n, not including n. So we can start to draw a picture of this, all the different roots of these different polynomials, just putting them on a number line. I can notice first off that because cosine ranges between minus 1 and 1, so will these roots. We can see for t1, we're going to have exactly one root at x equals 0. For t2, we're going to have two roots at plus or minus the square root of 2 over 2. For the third polynomial, we'll have three roots occurring at plus or minus root 3 over 2 and 0. And for t4, we'll have four roots. The number is coming a little bit more complicated, but occurring approximately where I've drawn them in the picture. Now, one of the behaviors that I want to point out that's happening here is that between any roots of t4, I find a root of t3. Between any two roots of t3, I can find a root of t2. Between any two roots of t2, I can find a root of t1, and, and so on and so forth. This is a property that's true not just for the Chebyshev polynomials, but for any sequence of orthogonal polynomials. It's called root interlacing. We have the following theorem. Between any two adjacent roots of the n plus 1th polynomial, there's going to be a root of the nth polynomial. To prove this, we're going to use the christoffel darbo formula that we had determined up above. To start out, let's grab two adjacent real simple roots of pn plus 1. Here by adjacent, I mean that they are uh, as close as possible together. There's no roots in between. If I remember the christoffel darbo formula, it says the sum from k equals 0 to n of pk squared over the norm of pk squared is going to be equal to some constant coming from the three-term recursion relation divided by the norm of pn squared times the derivative of pn plus 1 times pn minus pn plus 1 times the derivative of pn. Now if I think about it for a second, because these are simple roots, between these two roots, my polynomial has to do something like this. Here's lambda 1 and lambda 2. And here's my polynomial. It has to pass through one and go through the other. In particular, the derivative is going to change sign somewhere in between these two things. Now, the sum on the left-hand side is strictly greater than 0. So the expression on the right-hand side must be as well. If I evaluate this specifically at the roots, what this tells me is the expression negative a n over the product of pn with itself times pn plus 1 prime evaluated lambda k times pn of lambda k must be strictly greater than 0. That tells me that since the derivative flip sign necessarily pn itself must also flip sign at these two different points. So it's positive at one part and negative at another part. And hence, by the intermediate value theorem, we must have that pn 
pass through the x-axis, I have a root somewhere in the interval between lambda 1 and lambda 2. Now this of course assumed that the roots were simple, so I could say something about the derivatives. So to finish my proof, what I need to do is I need to show that all of the roots of this polynomial are simple. And that we can do with the next theorem. The theorem is that Pn has exactly n real simple roots for any n greater than or equal to 0. To prove this theorem, let's let lambda 1 through lambda n be the real roots of Pn with odd multiplicity. So I don't care about any roots with even multiplicity. I don't care about any complex roots. I just want the ones with odd multiplicity. Then what I can notice about this polynomial is that Pn of x times the product of x minus lambda 1 through x minus lambda n is going to be either always greater than or equal to 0 or less than or equal to 0. In other words, it's never going to change sign. Without less of generality, I can assume that it's going to be greater than or equal to 0 always. But this actually implies that the integral of Pn times this function times our weight function from b to c is also going to be greater than zero. And the only way that this can happen, because Pn is orthogonal to all the polynomials less than or equal to it, the only way that this can happen is if the polynomial that I'm integrating Pn against also has degree at least n. And clearly, m was less than or equal to n, so m actually has to be n. And what this means is that all of the roots have odd multiplicity. And I didn't even take the multiplicities here, so all of these distinct things with different odd multiplicity all have to be, uh, there has to be n of them exactly, so it's n distinct roots. Okay. So the situation that we proved in the previous theorem was exactly the situation that we always have. All of our roots are simple and real. Okay, so that's quite a bit for today. We'll go ahead and stop there. I'll see you guys next time.